Um, just because I really believe that people have a right to belong wherever they are and they have a right to grow up in safety where their needs are met and where their community accepts them. And if that is not happening in the place that they were born, then they have the right to change that place. And I see kind of the work of refugee resettlement and facilitating that and like seeing refugees as humans first and foremost who have needs of safety and acceptance and belonging to be just like really valuable and inspirational work. You're listening to Seeking Refuge, a podcast about the human story behind refugees. Your host for this week is Aidan Thomason. Hi, Katie. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Well, first, I wanted to welcome you and um, thank you for taking the time to interview. I know you're really busy. Thank you for having me. Would you introduce yourself and give a brief introduction? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Katie Hines. I just graduated from USC from the Honors College um, this past May in 2019, where I was in international studies and Spanish major. Um, and got involved in a lot of like social work related issues and research on campus, which kind of led me to working with um, Dr. Brianne Grace in the College of Social Work, um, who does a lot of work with refugee issues, and um, which led me to yeah working with her on a project about anti-refugee le- legislation in South Carolina, and then working at the Scholastic Soccer Program, which is where I did my senior thesis. And now, actually, tomorrow, I am leaving to join the Peace Corps, um, where I'll be working in um, Eswatini, formerly Swaziland, for two years. So that is a little bit about me. So was there a specific uh, moment or experience? What sparked your interest in working with refugees? I was really interested in learning languages in high school. Um, I really loved learning Spanish and which kind of like sparked an international interest that I like wanted to pursue when I got to college. And that was why I picked my international studies major and was kind of interested in like the human rights aspect of international studies. And so I was looking for kind of related research opportunities and found Dr. Grace and didn't know like a ton about like the ins and outs of refugee policy or law or experience, which a lot of people don't, right? That's like a really common thing for most um, Americans. But kind of my experiences with her uh, just like really sparked my interest in that whole process. And I came to find that I just really believed in advocating for refugees and like, telling their experiences and like easing their transition or like making it possible um, as much as I could because as we know that that's a thing that's really threatened um, pretty much throughout all of U.S. history, but especially in this political climate, um, just because I really believe that people have a right to belong wherever they are and they have a right to grow up in safety where their needs are met and where their community accepts them. And if that is not happening in the place that they were born, then they have the right to change that place. And kind of as people, we've created these ideas of borders and like nation states and imposed this really rigid and unforgiving and a lot of times inhumane system on people. And it doesn't fit a lot of times. It ends up being really cruel and violent to a lot of people. Um, And I see kind of the work of refugee resettlement and facilitating that and like seeing refugees as humans first and foremost who have needs of safety and acceptance and belonging to be just like a really valuable and inspirational work. 
So you mentioned your research with Dr. Grace. Um, could you elaborate mm-hmm. a little bit on what specifically you were researching and what you did? Absolutely. I got connected with her in the fall of 2016. And earlier that year, um, I believe in January of 2016, the state Senate had proposed a bill called S-997 um, that basically it couldn't fully eliminate refugee resettlement in South Carolina, but it was trying its best. Um, and it proposed creating a registry for refugees so that they would have to register with the Department of Social Services. Um, And there was discussion for a while of wanting to make that information um, available to the public, which is, of course, really unsafe, really invasive um, for people. And then it also wanted to make organizations that helped resettle refugees um, have civil liability should a refugee like commit a crime. Um, these NGOs or nonprofits that help resettle them would be like liable in civil court, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, it basically, yeah, it was trying to make South Carolina so unhospitable to refugees basically stop that these organizations that help resettle them would be like, we can't take on a civil liability we're not going to be able to continue doing this. And luckily it didn't end up, it passed the Senate. It didn't end up passing the house um, and it never became law, but there are all these hours of public testimony in which South Carolina residents came um, to voice um, either their opposition to the bill, but also frequently their support. Um, And so I looked at those testimonies and did a lot of transcription and analysis of how people were discussing refugees, like what were the narratives that they're telling about them and how like kind of wildly those differed from reality a lot of times. Um, And we kind of broke that down and specifically looked at how people are conceptualizing who refugees are based on ideas of like gender, um, nationality, and um, religion, and then how that so often ties into racism. Like people can talk about Islam as this thing that they're afraid of. And, and yes, that may be true, but it also all ties into this larger picture of race and who typically white Christian conservative Americans view as a threat and who they view their image of what the U.S. is and should be and their image of who refugees are, which as described was a lot of times like mostly young men who are Muslim and from the Middle East. And then there's the layer of, even if that were true, it's still like, it's still fine. It's still blatant racism and xenophobia to be scared of that particular population. Yeah. We just kind of looked at those um, generalizations and, made some um, analysis of what perspectives were informing those generalizations and then how you could like see that playing out in the South Carolina state house. So overall it was, it was a little bit daunting. Um, It was, did not necessarily paint a great picture of the citizens of our state all the time on the bright side. Like we know that this legislation didn't pass that, it wasn't necessarily the particular research that we were doing, but um, people did show up in huge numbers to oppose the bill, to say how it was invasive to people, how it what didn't improve public safety at all. Um, it just stated all these goals and then was not meeting them in any way. Um, so Dr. Grace and I wrote a paper together about that, which um, also made me want to get more involved with the refugee population in my community itself because it, like it was fine to kind of understand all these dynamics and I felt like I had a really good idea of what people were up against then at that point but I wanted to be able to truly get involved contribute my time to people who may need it and so that is kind of what led me to get more involved with this class of soccer program. Were there any specific examples from the public testimonies, um, either in support or opposition of the bill, that really stuck out to you? Oh, um, probably the most terrible ones are the ones that stuck with me the most, (laughs) unfortunately, um, because we also did look at people most who supported 
like limiting resettlement. One thing that we like a quote that we kind of delved into a little bit was um, someone who was actually be passed a lot of like fear mongering around Syrian refugees um, and their resettlement. And this person said like, but these refugees who coming who are coming to South Carolina, they're not just Syrians. Which is, was 100% true. Like, it's a very, very small percentage of refugees coming to South Carolina who are Syrians. And yet, <laughs> the fact that, that the justification in favor of resettlement was that the refugees who are actually being resettled are much more acceptable to the idea of what, like, white Christian America should be than these people believed. So that I've been turning over in my brain for a couple of years now um, of like justification or expl- how do you, how you phrase like education about um, refugee resettlement and how complicated that can be because sometimes public, mi- public perceptions are so different from reality, but at the same time, those opinions are inherently like viewing one group of people as negative. And it's like, yes, while that's a very small group of people that's coming to South Carolina, those are still people too, who are fleeing conflict and have a need to try to make a life for themselves. That's not surrounded by conflict. So, but it has, I think it has really fueled just how I think about like, Education, because I think educate like in terms of refugee resettlement, because I think um, we and I was actually in a class last semester with Dr. Grace um, about refugees, which um, is excellent. So if anyone from USC listens to this podcast, I 100% recommend her course on that. Um, but we kind of got to this point in the end of the semester, so we're like, okay, now what? Like, where do we go from here? How do we? use all this information and a lot of like class consensus was like oh we have to educate people and it's like yes absolutely 100% true and how do we do that in a way that's just like not somehow dehumanizing a group of people that maybe not might not be the exact one that we're talking about it's it's ends up being very complicated (laughs) so you mentioned this earlier and I should have asked you earlier um but could you give like a brief explanation on the idea of nation states and borders because that is a new phenomenon yeah so a nation state it's um like kind of a, a a geographical but then also like human entity that is governed by like a like a state apparatus which we think of as a government but it's like everything that has the power in that area and in general having like language or culture and then just like the ability to um exercise control like within that area and over those people like nation states like would have the right to use force um which we like you could see in like police exercising force against um like it's their own population or things like that um and then like regulating who comes in and out of their country which we see like with borders and so often we Because, you know, the borders that we grew up with and that we know are all that we know, right? Unless um, you maybe have lived long enough to live through, like, the breakup of the Soviet Union. And now, like, it's all... And so we see, like, these little shifts. I remember being in um, high school when Sudan um, split into Sudan and South Sudan. So these things change, but a lot of times we view them as really static. And, like, this is just how this is. And this border which says you can't cross me, like is just allowed to be there. And it's so often these are totally artificial things that are results of a lot of the time, like colonialism, um, white supremacy, violence, war. And a lot of times like European men coming in and like drawing lines and having no knowledge of people who live there um, and saying, okay, this is what this is now, which creates a lot of conflict that, um, creates a lot of conditions for the refugee crises um, or situations that we see around the world. But then it also really hinders human movement and migration a lot of times. And a lot of people and places in the world have this idea that migration is unnatural or bad. Um, 
And a lot of those views come from really privileged places where that it's also hinged to the idea of like, we can't have any more people here because they'll threaten our right way of life. They'll take our resources. They're just trying to drain us of X, Y, Z. I have within my college career just been exposed to a lot more thinking that just like really questions the nature, the nature of borders and why we can so strictly regulate human activity and movement and how that is so dehumanizing a lot of times because we know that families don't care about border like families don't follow borders natural disasters don't follow borders jobs economic flows um conflict political views none of these things are easily defined by borders and yet we cannot as people, well, in the U.S., we have one of the best passports in the world, so we don't personally have that much trouble with it, but there's so many people in the world who are just bound by these just, like, social constructs um, that, yes, um, I end up thinking a lot about, and it's, I think, really hopeful and interesting to kind of reimagine um a world as like what what does the system look like um and that's another thing that um I've talked a lot about Dr. Grace but I think she has been a really great influence and um different professors and like my study abroad, abroad program throughout college um of like you can think about like reforming systems and making these like tiny incremental changes to these large institutions that like do so much harm to people and you can also think about what does like a completely different world look like and how do we get there? You know, like um, there's a quote that I love um, from like an organizer and activist called um, Adrian Marie Brown. And she says like all um, activism is science fiction. We're trying to build a world that we have never experienced yet. And we're just um, imagining what could be. I think I paraphrased the end of that just a little bit. But I really appreciate that quote applied to so many different areas, but especially states and borders of what could the system look like if it truly centered like human well-being and humanity in general. Thank you for that. That'll be super helpful for our listeners. Could you tell us a little bit about your honors project? Um, what inspired yes. you and what you learned? Absolutely. I was um, a tutor previous, like previous to my senior year, with the Scholastic Soccer Program, and really loved um, working with the kids that come there. I just really enjoy working with youth, and kind of that combination in that program of like structure and maybe working on math homework or playing soccer, um, and then within those bounds too, like I've had just so many really great conversations, um, with kids and they're just hilarious and wonderful. Um, and just like running around and having a grand old time. So I really enjoyed the environment, um, and wanted to work with my honors thesis with that program. And I had done some reading that I was really interested in. Oh, I guess, um, I'll back up just a little bit. In my study abroad program um, this semester before my senior year, I was in a, like a multi-country program. Um, so I spent a month each in Nepal, Jordan, and Chile. Um, and we did independent research projects that we like designed, carried out, wrote paper on, um, but that spanned those three countries. And my project had to do with um, psychosocial services for women who are displaced um and so in each of those contexts displacement looked somewhat different um there were i was able to speak with um, women who are refugees in jordan and in nepal but i also looked at different forms of displacement like women who had to leave their homes because of domestic violence um or economic migration, or migrant workers, or things like that, where given if given the option, these women would have stayed at home, um, but they were not given that option, or they had to make the decision for their the welfare of themselves or their families. That is inherently, a lot of times, a really traumatic 
process of like rupture and loss of community and transition. Um, and so I was looking at what kind of maybe formal support services were available and then what informal ways people coped and found support um, or then maybe didn't, like what were those holes also. Um, So that was a very involved project. But what I found a lot of times was how women would speak about belonging and community as like a main source of healing from that trauma of displacement. And it, we, we talked a lot about like formal mental health care, which definitely has its place and need, um, especially in like situations of like PTSD or things like that. And then also when it does like sitting one-on-one like with a counselor and talking about like how your home was destroyed, maybe not solve your disconnection or your like lack of community um or the fact that you don't know like where dinner is coming from or how you're gonna get a job and so like I provide support in ways that people need so that's what I was thinking about when I got back from studying abroad and I developed a photo voice uh project to do with youth at the classic soccer program um and photo voice is when Um, research participants answer a research question that you come up with beforehand um, by taking their, uh, by taking pictures of their, of the world around them and how they like choose to interpret and answer that question. So it's this really cool, like participatory research method um, and you can apply it for all sorts of goals, whether you like want to get this information um, as like a needs assessment of a people or organization or um, advocate for a specific cause, or like build community with an art exhibit, or all these different things. Um, and it's also really non-invasive. It gives a lot of agency to participants, which I thought was really important um, as working with children who are refugees who have experienced like displacement and a lot of rupture in their lives. Um, it's not necessarily super ethical or cool to show up and be like so tell me about the most traumatic thing that's happened to you to a child like that's really damaging but if you ask a question and give them a camera um and say like how would you answer this they just have a lot of control over their story and how they see their story and how they want to tell you their story um and that ends up being a really amazing thing so my question um that we posed kind of in the light of thinking about belonging and um, whether like classic soccer was kind of meeting that need for community that um, people have when they get here because you may be set up with like some social services resources, some employment resources, a school, but are you, do you feel like you belong anywhere? Do you feel like you have a community um, that accepts you? So the question was, do you feel like you belong? family friends um and at over the course of several weeks at scholastic soccer um kids took pictures to answer those questions and then we did um like little interviews with them which I transcribed um and then I was able to make some of their quotes and um pictures into a photo book which we then were able to like send to families um and I really loved that it was really driven by the youth. Like they of course took their own pictures, but then out of the many pictures that they took, they picked the ones that they wanted to go into the book and then told me what they meant um, and what they wanted, like the story that they wanted to include. And we found a lot of times that scholastic soccer really does provide this like just community space for youth to come and maybe see friends that they wouldn't see at school or that they do see at school, but it's in like a slightly less structured environment Um, or to get resources. Like multiple people mentioned that it's like, if you don't know how to do something, they'll help you figure it out. They'll help you do your homework. They'll help you fill out this form, like stuff like that. So I think last year and I'm, I know I'm not there this year, but I would imagine that this is continuing, um, just like some efforts to maybe reimagine this plastic soccer program a little bit um, or figure out how to keep like kids most engaged or 
it give them the most benefits like from the preferencing um like the needs of the volunteers and things like that and so there was a lot of discussion about like making it just a one-on-one like mentoring program um which I totally see the academic benefits for um but it was really nice to be able to talk to like the head of the program and say like here's what kids have been telling me this semester about how this is also just really important as contributing to their feelings of belonging in their community and kids are also just so funny and say the best things um so uh, the interview transcriptions just are beautiful like pictures into like their inner monologues (laughs) so you've mentioned it at the beginning when you did your introduction but could you tell us what your exciting next steps are now that you're graduated um, so about 24 hours from now, I'm getting on a plane um, to join the Peace Corps, and I am going to be working as a youth development volunteer in the Kingdom of Eswatini, which is formerly Swaziland. It's a small country um, located right between South Africa and Mozambique, um, and it actually has the highest percentage of people in the world um, infected with HIV or AIDS. Um, So a lot of my work will focus on sexual and reproductive health education and also like job skills, preparing you for the workforce, um, life skills, civic engagement, things like that. So I will be working in a rural school about four days a week and like leading teaching like let those life skills classes and then leading some after school clubs like a girls empowerment group um and then also like doing some community activities for youth who may be out of school and just other community needs so i'm not working with refugee populations um specifically but with like some at-risk youth um which kind of ties into my experience with the scholastic soccer and I think that experience really fueled my um love for working with youth and kind of led me to this path so very excited um I hope to pursue a master's of social work um after I get back in about two years I can definitely see myself working with refugee populations long term but off in a slightly different direction for the next few years um, and a very long geographic distance. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you. Well, that's all I've got for you. Thank you so much for sitting down with us. I know you're super busy with yeah. leaving 24 hours from now for the Peace Corps. Um, <laughs> you've got a lot of experience and insight um, that we really appreciate. So it was great to talk well, to you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to Seeking Refuge. If you have a story you'd like to share, get in touch with us by sending us an email at seekingrefugepodcast at gmail.com. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Seeking Refuge Podcast, and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Our show wouldn't be made possible without the wonderful support from Maxi International House at the University of South Carolina. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode.